Well, comrade chair and comrades, I think that Claire has set the right tone for this meeting because we are in the fight of our lives and it's not just the young but it's the old, the sick, the most vulnerable sections of society and the step towards this struggle is undoubtedly the one day general strike that has been proposed by the last trade union congress and also of course the demonstration on October the 20th. And the first point that I would like to make here is that decision for the general strike was, did not drop from the sky. It wasn't accidental. It was prepared by the work of the National Shop Stewards Network in conjunction with the RMT, with other radical unions such as the PCS, and it went through the General Council of the TUC on a motion proposed by the Prison Officers Association. Now this has is, this is, uh, caused discussion and comment internationally. In Germany, for instance, in a trade union discussion that took place there, a, a leading intellectual said, the way forward for Germany is what the socialists and what the Marxists are doing in the British labour movement itself. And it's incredible that an organisation like the Prison Officers Association, which was condemned by some on the left in the past as being beyond redemption, they weren't militant in any way, are now in the vanguard of the struggle taking place in Britain. So much so that Bob Crow said at the TUC, if we go on strike, they won't be able to arrest us because there'll be no prisons open because the POA will be out <laughs> on strike. And that is down to the pressure which the young socialists in the, 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 the Socialist Party and which trade union members in our ranks have been responsible for. And if it was left, let's be clear about this, if this is left to the General Council of the TUC and the elephants of the TUC, such as the outgoing General Secretary, Brendan Barber, well, there's a well-known uh, comedian, I suppose, Mark Steele, who had a kind of spoof of the kind of advice that would be given by Brendan Barber about preparing for that strike. And it goes like this. We have decided to show our opposition to the government's economic policy, but so as not to disrupt everyday life, we are holding the protest at 4 a.m. <laughs> when we hope millions of you, I've got a fan here. <laughs> we, we, we hope that millions of you will join us in a 15 minute dream of action. <laughs> during which our members will dream that Mr. Osborne reverses some of his damaging policies. Now that's very funny, but in it is a serious point. Only by the, the mobilization of the mass pressure of the working class through their organizations will we get a demonstration that's effective in the first place. And remember, there's a certain amount of skepticism because the right-wing trade union leaders of, of uh, Unison called off the struggle against the pensions. That should be no excuse for the maximum mo mobilization of working people themselves. And we have a struggle on our hands. Because as Claire indicated, one leg of the coalition assembled in Brighton this week, that is the Liberal Democrats. And really, they are now on neoliberal policy. Nick Clegg has done to the Liberal Democrats what Blair did to the Labour Party. He was a capitalist entrance. There were people who used to attend the Liberal Democratic Conference who were there because they made jam at home and sold them to fellow delegates. They were harmless people but they were liberals in the real sense of the term. This is now a right-wing party that is backing up to the hilt the vicious austerity program of the, of the Tories themselves. And when Clegg says, I apologize, as Claire correctly pointed out, and then went on to make this wonderful, um, out with this wonderful song that went onto the internet, if he was going to apologize for all his crimes, He'd have to bring out an album or a box set, or a box set of, his, uh, of his songs in order to apologize for what is taking place. 
This is a reflection, even this conference, of the deteriorating economic situation that we have in Britain, which is the most serious since the 1930s, and in some senses is even more serious than that. How many times have we repeated, almost endlessly at meetings like this in the last period, since this coalition government came to power? The coalition did not create this crisis. <clears throat> this is a crisis of capitalism. It's not even down to the fa fact that George Osborne is wicked, which he is, or that Cameron is a little bit, if you like, intellectually challenged. <laughs> but they are presiding over a crisis, over a system that's in crisis. And the essence of this system is that it's a system based upon not social need, not what you and I need in our daily lives, but it's based upon one criteria. It's based upon production for profit. Look what Vince Cable said in his big, big, big speech this week in, in, the, in the Liberal Democratic Conference. He said, the major problem today is lack of demand. And in a certain sense, that is correct. But is there lack of demand? There's two and a half million people who want a job. There's the needs that is growing. That's not in education, in employment, in training. The young people who are crying out for a job. There's a, a vegetation, a vegetation of, of youth vegetating on the dole at the present time. We have now drugs, suicide, a thousand people. <coughs> it's now estimated have committed suicide since the crisis began in 2000, uh, 2008, directly attributed to the crisis and its effects on youth and on working people. There's housing, there's education, and yet what is the solution? of the Troika and of capitalism to the Greek people. They go to Greece and say, you must work an extra one day a week, those of you who've got jobs, against the background of mass unemployment. It's absolutely crazy, but it's the craziness of the capitalist system itself. And when Claire says the 750 billion pounds in the banks, of, of the British banks, that's true, but that's dwarfed by the amount that are in the vaults of the big companies worldwide. And estimated, according to the Observer, about two months ago, on its front page, it reported that it is in the vaults of the big companies internationally a total of 13 trillion pounds, not million trillion pounds, that's lying idle. That's about 21, 21 trillion dollars. That's the equivalent of the GDP, the gross domestic product of America, and of Japan put together. Why is it lying idle in the banks? Why is it not used to save this continent, not Britain, but this continent from the economic catastrophe? Because it does not pay the ruling class, the capitalists, to invest at this stage. When Vince Cable came forward and said, he's gonna set up a bank with resources of one billion pounds, that's a trifle. That will not solve the problems confronting capitalism in Britain and worldwide at the present time. British capitalism is now a zombie capitalism, with zombie banks and with zombie uh, companies as well. When the government printed, printed uh, money in order to try and inject it into the system, all that it did was it ended up in the pockets of the capitalists themselves, who then invested in speculation and in the process of preparing another financial catastrophe in Britain and on a world scale. One suggestion which an expert in the Financial Times came forward with is why don't we drop money, we have helicopter money, drop it on the population and perhaps they'll go out and spend. Even that wouldn't necessarily work, by the way, because if they dropped it in the rich area, they'd run along to the banks and they'd put it back in the banks. Why don't we bury some money and have a kind of treasure hunt amongst the population? I'm not talking about one or two pounds here. I'm talking about hundreds of thousands of millions of pounds. They're desperate to try and get the system working at the present time. But it's not working because it's a one of those historical turning points where anything they try to do comes up against certain obstacles. For instance, if you uh, give money to people, if you give money to companies, they have resources, but they're afraid to spend. The banks are afraid to lend because they believe correctly they will never get their money back. 
This is the problem that exists as far as capitalism is concerned. And it's true that Cameron himself has said, you will not escape this crisis, and even then that's not sure, uh, at least until the end of this decade. So we have eight years of austerity to face. Endless austerity is not a phrase. It's reflected in the brutality of the day-to-day -day living standards of working people at this moment in time. If you want to see your future, go to Greece as I did three weeks ago and have discussions with the young people and the working class in that country. And you can see what is happen happening. Go look at what's happening in Portugal. And I spoke to a group of young people in the four days I was present in Greece. I said to one young comrade, what's your position? <coughs> he said, I'm a locksmith, but I'm going to be sacked tomorrow. What are you going to do? I'm going to try and come to London. I said, do you know the number of unemployed young people in London at the present time? I said to another black refugee, do you have a job? Yes. How many hours a week? Four hours a week. What is your rate of pay? It's five euros an hour. I said, how the hell do you live? Another young person couldn't keep up their flat. Their flatmate was forced to return to the villages because there's no teachers now. Return to the villages and educate a younger sister because the edu education system is collapsing around their ears. The youth of, of Greece are scattered to the four corners of Europe and the world. In Portugal, the Prime Minister has said to young people there, there is no future for you in this society. Go to Angola or Mozambique, the former colonies of Portuguese imperialism. That's the situation that exists at the present time. Before our eyes, we see the disintegration of the middle class taking place in Greek society. If you were to show a film to the people in Greece today, five years ago, of where they are at the present time, they would say it's a malicious exaggeration. Yesterday, we had a tremendous demonstration in Greece. When I questioned some of our comrades in Greece, we have a section of the Committee for the Workers International, Sikinema, that is growing in strength in Greece at this stage. I said, what is likely to be the turnout on this 20, 20th general strike? They said, we don't think there'll be much enthusiasm because working people are a bit low after everything that, that they've gone through. They were amazed at the flood of people who came onto the streets of Athens and the other cities of Greece. Not just the youth, not just the working class, but the middle class. For the first time, it seems, you had shopkeepers coming out in solidarity with working people. Practically the whole of the Greek nation, if you want, apart from a small layer at the top. There was even representatives of the police union marching on that demonstration yesterday, according to the Independence Report. And that will take, a movement like that is knocking at the door of history. All that it needs is a party, a program, in order for working people to go forward and break with the system. Up to now, they haven't found it. And if this goes on, the 24% unemployment, which is the level of the depression in the US in the 1930s, will not only continue, it will get worse. It can't come here people will say. We can't have the situation of Spain, which is similar to what is developing in Greece. It's not possible in a highly educated, civilized country like Britain. Don't you believe this? If you look at what, what took place two weeks ago when the Save the Children Fund launched for the first time a campaign for starving children in Britain, that's the beginning of a process that could end up with Greece returning here. In fact, Britain today is Greece in slow motion. It has the conditions in many parts of the society that could end up like Greece. However, we have a working class and we have a force in the form of the Socialist Party and others who are linked to the unions, which is the vital ingredient that was missing in the previous, if you like, not five years, because the Greek crisis goes back to ten years itself. Nevertheless, if you examine what the coalition promises for working people, it's an absolute disaster. For instance, they've announced that at least one third of state and council property will be sold off 
in a massive programme of uh, privatisation. We had in, in Knowsley, in, on the outskirts of Liverpool, a council there that is proposing to sell off wholesale council services. And this is a Labour council, by the way. It's a one-party regime, in, in effect, because there's not a single council that is not Labour in that council. And because there's no organised opposition in the form of a party, although we're fighting for that, these people think that they can get away with anything. And unfortunately, they will be able to if we don't mobilise our forces, if you like, from below. By the way, even the coalition is beginning to feel the pressures of the situation itself. For instance, in Oxford, it's Tories who are now saying, well, private doesn't necessarily equal good and public bad, because the consequences of privatisation are obvious in the health service, in social services, and so on. And on top of all of this, we will expect in the next period an additional £14 billion pounds worth of cuts, on top of what we've seen in the course of the last two years itself. It means job losses for teachers. It means regional pay, which is a device for cutting the wages of state employers at the present time. Even Cameron, by the way, balked at the prospect of the attack on the social services and on, on child support and things like that that were promised by Ian Duncan Smith. That's one of the reasons why he tried to move him in the Tory reshuffle and tried to replace him with somebody else. But IDS refused to go. And now we have in the press today and yesterday speculation that the promise to remove pensions uh, concessions, bus passes, TV licenses and so on is not just provoking opposition from, uh, from, the, from working people, but there's opposition developing among, amongst rich Tory pensioners as well, who are objecting to their bus passes which they paid for previously in their taxes and so on. All of this shows the incapacity of capitalism to take society forward. And you will believe that the kind of speech that I make my making here tonight, or that Claire has made, that will be the stock in trade of the leaders of the trade union and labour movement, rousing working people, giving them a certain direction, First of all, based upon an analysis of what is happening in capitalism. And then on the basis of that, coming forward with real alternatives in order to show a way forward. Just at this moment in time, when capitalism is on its knees, because that's what it is, what does the leadership of the Labour Party do? That is Ed Miliband. What they do when they come forward and they make a proposal in relation to the, the way forward at the present time. In an interview with The Telegraph, not the normal reading of the people who are here tonight, a right-wing paper, in an interview with The Telegraph, Ed Miliband, over a heading, says, I want to save capitalism my father hated. His father was Ralph Miliband, who was a, a kind of theoretician of the left within the Labour Party, who at least stood against capitalism and stood against the agents of capitalism. That was the right wing within the Labour Party as we did. And in the course of this discussion, he comes out and says, well, it's the best system that we have. Well, in, in other words, he's, he's, it's, I'll put it more accurately at what he said. It's the, it's the least worst system that one could contemplate. How does he know? We haven't tried a planned economy in socialism in an advanced industrial country. We've not reached that in Britain. We had an experiment, if you like, that broke with capitalism in Russia in 1917 and inspired the whole of the world, the 10 days that shook the world. Unfortunately, in a backward country, with a largely peasant country, with cultural backwardness and so on, it wasn't possible to proceed to create a, a viable socialist planned economy. There was heroic efforts made by the Russian working class, and working people internationally tried to emulate it. But they were blocked by the leaders of the social democracy who stood in the way of the working class moving in the direction of power. And therefore, a one-party dictatorship grew up in that situation. It's not possible in an advanced industrial country for to, to have a bureaucracy, a privileged elite of that character arising in Britain at the present time. So that argument goes out the window. And then what does uh, Ed Miliband come forward? He says, well, we must support 
uh, we're against predator capitalism, we're in favour of good capitalism. Actually, that's a variation on the capitalist theme of the, 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 the deserving and the undeserving poor. It's the philosophy of the deserving rich and the undeserving rich, if you like. It is a false idea. And then we get this other idea of Miliband. He stands not for redistribution of the wealth, which would be a step forward, it would be the old position of the left in the Labour Party. It's not possible to do that, by the way, unless you fundamentally change society. And he's come forward with, with now a pre-distribution of the wealth. If that means anything, that means before you take power, you weigh up the resources in society and you come forward with a plan of production. It means a plan. That's the, the content, if it means anything at all. And therefore, why doesn't he come forward and say, we, we're, we're in favour of planning? In effect, what he's proposing is the idea of a Keynesian policy of state expenditure in order to overcome this deadlock in the capitalist system. Well, we are in favour of a, a useful programme of public works, but in order to pay for that, that programme of public works, it has to be paid for by the capitalist, or it has to be paid for by the working class, or you resort to the printing press to produce pound notes not backed up by the production of goods and services. If you can take the money and increase taxes from the capitalist, they'll go on a strike of capital. I'll explain that in a minute. If you take it from the working class, it cuts the market. That's the dilemma on the basis of capitalism. Don't take my word for it. Look over the channel with the coming to power of the French president, Hollande, who promised to create teachers' jobs, who promised to create a, 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 more, a greater disparity or a greater evenness of wealth in, in French society. What has he done? Because of the threat of the capitalists to leave France, he's begun to water down his wealth tax and says, well, it will go after two years. And as for the other proposals, he's, he's, uh, he's, he's now backed away from a reflationary programme and is putting forward a programme of £30 billion worth of cuts. If uh, Miliband comes to power, and it's likely, if you look at the polls, that the, the, the Labour Party is now 10% 10 10 ahead in the polls. That has nothing to do with support for Miliband himself, but reflects the opposition to the Tories and the Liberal Democrats at this particular moment in time. You don't have to read about it. You don't even have to think about it. We have an expression of what a government led by Miliband and Balls will be when he went to the TUC conference and said, in the event of coming to power, we have to be so-called honest we will hold down wages and we will, we will uh, increase taxes and that will be necessary in order to have a boost in employment. Well, we heard this all before, by the way, in 1974 to 1980 with the social contract at that stage where wages were held down and the promise was jobs would be created. It didn't happen because it's not in the gift of any government that remains within capitalism to proceed in that particular way as well. And therefore, the arguments used by Miliband and the leadership of New Labour is preparing a terrible period of disappointment for working people in the event of them coming to power. And that raises the question, which Claire touched on, what is the alternative? Well, obviously, we believe a socialist planned economy. But at the same time, the trade union leaders in Britain are continuing to prop up this party. For instance, Unite is given at least a million pounds, up to a million pounds. The largest left trade union, at least nominally, has given a million pounds to the Labour Party in the last quarter, and other right-wing unions have followed in the wake of that. And behind this idea is, well, we have to wait for the Labour government because then we will get concessions. Behind that is the idea, well, the Labour Party of Miliband, they have to talk like they're talking now, in order to disguise what they really stand for. They're really wolves in sheep's clothing. Believe you me, they're not. They're lambs in sheep's clothing. In the event of them coming to power, they will disappoint the hopes and the aspirations of working people. You have the, we had, for instance, recently, one of the right wing of the Labour Party, Jack Straw, who actually wrote an article. He's, he's done his, uh, his memoirs. And in his memoirs, he makes the, the, the following point. He says, well, he's been suffering from depression. Now, anybody who suffers from depression, we feel, we feel sympathy for that. And he says he suffered from depression 
for 30 years, but then he goes on to blame us. <laughs> he actually says, and I'll read out, the, 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 he says, in a new book, Last Man Standing, it reveals he's faced an intensely personal crisis. In 1981, he went deaf in one, one ear, while under, under fire from Labour's militant tendency. You think we had, you think we had cannons or, or, or field guns, so he went deaf in one, one, one year. He came under terrible stress. Jack Straw, for those of you who do not know him, when we had a newspaper called Militant, and we were a tremendous power in Liverpool, and we built houses, and there was a mass movement and so on, the anniversary of which we will celebrate next year, in 2013, what, what was done on that date, Jack Straw was one of those who attacked the Liverpool City Council, and eventually defeated them, eventually expelling the leaders of that movement from the Labour Party, and if he's had problems with depression, we sympathise with him. But it was nothing to the councillors who fought in that struggle, who had their houses possibly taken away from them, who were victimised and driven out of jobs for what? Standing up in defence of working people and establishing in, in practice what was possible on the basis of a fighting programme. And if you think we're opposed to Jack Straw, look at his role recently revealed last weekend in the Independence on Sunday, in relation to the, the frame-up of the Hillsborough tragedy. That is equivalent to what happened in France with the Dreyfus affair at the end, the end of the last century, which was a frame-up against a Jewish officer by the military caste then. The police and the powers that be, this creature who was the editor of The Sun, who's now in hiding, the same man who appeared on television a year ago and saying, all of these people involved in the riots in London should be jailed, and they'd be sniveling and crying in the dock and so on. A really vicious individual. This man does not even have the courage to appear before people in the media and appear before the people of Liverpool. <coughs> now, today, he says he's threatening to sue the police for giving him wrong information, as if they held a gun to his head and said, print your lies in the sun. And it's an absolute abomination. But Jack Straw also connived in a cover-up over Hillsborough. That should not be forgotten. These are the people who expelled us, who expelled me 30 years ago from the Labour Party in 1983. And that was, that, that was because we stood up for working people. It didn't stop us from having a victory in Liverpool and a victory in the poll tax after that as well. And those people who say we must continue along this line, they are mistaken. Along this line, it means that the working people have no party to turn to. When you go to Knowsley and you say we're fighting the cuts, these people who are in the Knowsley Council, they're paid councillors now. They're not like the councillors of old uh, in, La in Labour Party who were devoted, if you like, to working people on a day-to-day -day basis. These are a caste who have their own interests at heart first and foremost. They will not listen to appeals, even to go on strike does not move them as we've seen in the movement in Southampton. You need to stand against them. You need to challenge their position. They need to be looking over their shoulder at a, at a struggle uh, to create a new party and to stand against them in the election. That's what we have done in the attempt to form through Tusk an alternative uh, basis at this stage for people to come together. At a later stage, we hope it will develop into a new party of the working class. And don't believe the Jerry Myers who say it's not possible. Look at what's happened in other countries. The left party in Germany, it's inadequate. It hasn't got a rounded out socialist program as yet, but it's an alternative which could be filled out by working people when they move into struggle. Or the situation with the left bloc in uh, Portugal, who also is inadequate, but nevertheless there are possibilities there. Even more the case with Melanchon in France, who in the course of the election campaign, because he was standing, and threatened or not threatening Hollande, pushed Hollande towards the left. And last but not least, the example of Syriza in Greece, that's come from 4% of the vote four years ago, now 28, 30%, and could be pushed into power in the next period. That shows all the possibilities that exist for the new party. Is it the last word that is to be spoken in the working class getting its own organisation? No, because even Syriza has inadequacies at the present time. It's been pushed into power 
It's a desperate position in Greece. And it demands a desperate and a viable program to speak for the, the majority of the Greek people themselves. What is that program? Cancel the debt. Not as Cyprus says, cancel the interest on the debt at the present time. Cancel the debt. Nationalize the banks. Nationalize the big companies. Then appeal to the people of Portugal, to the people of Spain and Ireland in the first instance, to come together into a socialist and democratic confederation. What a tremendous response that would get in Britain, in the movement here, or in Ireland, or for that matter in Germany. The whole of Europe is in, is in open arms against capitalism at this particular stage. It would have an enormous effect. Look what happened in Portugal the other day. They thought the Portuguese people were swallowing, were swallowing the austerity medicine. They were taking it. There was no protest, it seems. The traditions of the 1974 revolution were dead. And out of nowhere, a massive movement of at least 600,000 people led by the youth with the trade union leaders, did not leading it, but running behind, trying to catch up with the movement itself. Of 50,000 marching on the presidential palace. And what happened? The government cancelled part of the austerity programme. It's not a final victory, because they, 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 they made the mistake of trying to transfer the charges from the employers to the working class, and that provoked the, the workers coming out onto the streets. This shows this is a period when it won't be just a question of defeats. We can have victories. We can force this government back if the full power of the labour movement is used. If that is not done, there's a terrible warning for working people at the present time. And that is the rise of organisations of the far right. In Greece, the cost of the failure of the workers' organisation to show a way out is shown in the growth of Golden Dawn. From 0.7% in the polls to 7% in the elections and representation in the parliament, and now over 10% outvoting PASOK. Why did Golden Dawn develop? On the one side, because of the crisis of Greek capitalism. On the other, because of the role of PASOK in carrying through cuts. That's why it's so profoundly mistaken for the SWP in Waltham Forest and elsewhere in the battle against the EDL's march in Waltham Forest to say, to fight against our comrades of saying, you have to have a strategy of fighting the cuts. You have to criticise those Labour MPs and those councillors who are carrying out the cuts and show you're different to working people or you are creating the same conditions here as existed in Greece. You will be, be providing the ammunition for the development of the, of the EDL. Unfortunately, they have not yet seen this approach, but they will because on the basis of events, it's the only way out for working people themselves. So comrades, we are preparing for the general strike by marching on, on October the 20th, of utilizing that opportunity to, to mobilize as many working people as possible, not just for a parade, but to explain the nature of this crisis. Not just explain the nature of this crisis, say, this one day strike must, be, must take place and the TUC must set the date. A one day strike might not be enough, but it's the first time, if it takes place since the 1926 general strike, that we will have seen a mobilization in Britain. Even though it's restricted, just to the six million workers in the trade unions, it will be an earthquake. Nothing will be the same again. It will give hope to those who are trampled in the dust by capitalism at the present time. And it will prepare the basis for the development of the ideas of socialism. Because we're not just marching against, we are marching for a new society. We have to have a vision in this battle of what would be possible. When Ed Miliband says, holding his, 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 his blackberry, saying this is what capitalism is, it's the only way you can develop innovation and talent and so on. In fact, if you examine the history of innovation, the history of, of inventions, it's been mostly through the states, such as space travel, such as the internet and so on, that we've had the development. And that's under capitalism. Imagine if all the resources of society were mobilized to the benefit of all and not for the 1%, for the 99% and not for the 1%. And therefore, that is our program, our perspective for the developments in Britain in the next period of a struggle which is going to intensify, where working people will learn and struggle. 
We will be there pointing out the lessons of this struggle and raising the idea of an alternative society. Our model is not Stalinism. It's not the one-party regime, but it's a democratic planned economy that will benefit all. That is the music of the future. So fight for that future. Join the Socialist Party. Fight for socialism. And in that way, let's help to change the world.